Hi, everybody. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us today. We're looking forward to having a really good, exciting workshop today all about companion planting, one of my favorite topics because we do it all the time in our garden. I absolutely love it. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Carrie and this is Dale. He's going to be over here manning the chat. So make sure you guys hop in, say hi to us. Um, and also let us know where you're from. We'd love to see where you're joining us from. We are here in zone seven. You're typing, shaking the screen up here. Oh, whoops. <laughs> you're typing really <laughs> fast and furious. <laughs> um, we are in zone seven in Oklahoma and uh, the weather's actually been really nice the past week. It's been amazing. I love it. I'm getting super <laughs> excited for... It's been in like the 60s. It's yeah. It's been awesome. I'm getting really excited <laughs> to be able to actually get out there and start planting. It's We actually it's did about already. That time. We planted some spinach. We did. And some kale under one of our greenhouse raised beds that, we, that we've been building. Yeah. Yeah. So we got, were able to do a little bit early. We did some spinach kale and then we've been doing a lot of indoor seed starting, as you can see behind us. We have... I don't even know how many seeds we have started. Should have counted. I should have. Yeah, it, I have it all in the app. It's all logged in the app, so that way I can keep track of it. Because <laughs> we have so many things, I would for sure forget. Like, and there's videos all over with. our reels and our in our posts and stuff about everything we have going right now too. So, um, and also our last workshop was all about this as well. So, if you're curious on what to get started with growing food right now, check out some of that stuff. Today we're going to be talking about companion planting. And all about the, uh, yeah, well, just companion, but there's a lot of different ways to talk about companion planting. <laughs> we're we're going to cover all of them, I think. I, I hope so. We're going to cover it from a bunch of different angles. So it should be, should be fun. So um, like I said, companion planting is one of my favorite organic methods of like pest control. And it does, I mean, so many benefits from it. First of all, I love it. Um, but yes, let's uh, jump right in. Well, it's one of the things too, that whenever we started our garden, we did a lot of, and it really helped with pests. Mm -hmm. So this was our garden back uh, when we lived in the city. And we did a lot of interplanting and companion planting to help with pests and disease issues and all sorts of stuff. And uh, it definitely helps out a lot. So let's, I, I don't, one of our first slides is all about why. So let's jump into oh, the why. And I'm glad that this popped up. I, I have forget. to, yes, I always <laughs> forget to mention this. So I always put this in there to make sure I don't forget. But yes, we are doing a giveaway at the very end of this workshop for a one-year free premium from Seed to Spoon app subscription. So one lucky participant can get this. So make sure that you guys are popping in that chat and uh, chatting away each time you, uh, you comment and you get entered in to win. And then our behind-the-scenes helper, Andrew. Thank you, Andrew, for helping us out. He will uh, run the names through at the end and we'll get our winner. And there's a brand new feature coming to our premium users that we spent all day working on yesterday that we'll be rolling out this week. It's all about garden themes. So we have, uh, we're going to have about 30 different themes of plants that go well together for different reasons of growing. So we're really excited about this feature. We've been working on it for a while and um, finally getting the, the finishing touches on it and everything. So I'm really excited because it'll make, it'll make growing easy. Like you can actually go in there and do like what? Butterfly garden, do you end small space that garden, small herb space. gardens, Pasta, salsa, yeah, yeah, <laughs> everything you can imagine. <laughs> if you all have more ideas, throw them in chat of zone, <laughs> of themed gardens you should have because I I spent all day yesterday like coming up with new ones, and then when I thought I got to the end of the list, it's like oh, there are some more ideas. So that's where hamburger garden came from. <laughs> yeah, which ended up being a really good one. Shout out to mustard leaves, underrated player in the in the hamburger game when it comes to gardening. <laughs> Okay, so let's jump in and talk about companion planting. Oh, before we get started, one more thing again. Um, we're going to talk a lot about the why and stuff. Every plant has specific plants that work well with it or that don't work well with it. And this would be a very long workshop if we went through every single plant and talked about it. So good news is all of that information is right in our app. This is free for everyone. This is not a premium feature. If you go into plant details, so you're seeing spinach on the screen right now, um, it shows you all of the friends, things that grow well next to spinach, and the enemies, all the things that you should avoid planting next to spinach. So this is a, a really helpful companion planting guide that we put together. This is one of the first things that we built with the app. One of the reasons why we wanted to build the app mm -hmm. was to keep track of companions because there's a lot to keep track of. 
and a lot of different combinations and stuff like that. So, um, but I think it's important to understand the why behind companion planting and why it works and why it's beneficial. So let's jump in and talk about some of that stuff. Yeah. So, I mean, like, like you said, there's a lot of different reasons why you would want a companion plant. And one of the biggest ones is going to be for pollinators. You want to attract all sorts of different pollinators into your garden. So that way you don't have to do any pollination. You don't want to be doing any hand stuff um, by having those worker bees in the butterflies and hummingbirds. It not only brings life and beauty to your garden, it'll really help your plants too to thrive. So by adding these companion plants, you can help to improve the pollination in your garden as well and also attract some other beneficial critters. So there's things like ladybugs that are super helpful for like combating aphids. Um, there's green lace wings like that, that you can bring in to help with that too. Like there's so many different beneficial critters that you can attract into your garden by doing companion planting. And then there's also some that can help to improve soil. So not only just soil overall, but it can help give nutrients into your soil, which means that you have to fertilize less. I know everybody's all on board for that, right? That's that, that would get me. Uh, and then there's also some companion plants that work really well for trapping certain pests. So if you're having pest issues, sometimes it's beneficial to put a trap plant that that pest would want to eat instead of your other one that you're growing. And then also there's certain plants that repel pests as well too. So we're going to go into more detail on each one of these too, but I wanted to cover <coughs> all of those whys because there's so many different reasons why you would want a companion plant. Um, we got a great question here from Lisa that I want to go ahead and pull up. Okay. So she heard that French marigolds are better at battling bugs on plants than African marigolds. So this is a little bit true. Um, and my understanding on this basically is that French marigolds have uh, better properties for fighting off nematodes and pests that are below ground. Like they don't grow as large of plants, but they grow a lot of effort in the root. And they do a lot of, there's like proven science behind French uh, marigolds helping with with nematodes, whereas African marigolds grow like larger and have more of an aroma and help more with like more like a trap crop or putting off different scents. So that's my understanding of of marigolds, but it's been a bit since I've I've looked into it. But that's what I remember about it. So very interesting. All right, next I love slide. Marigolds. Yeah, next. Okay, so briefly, some plants that can help to bring in certain pollinators. Again, like the hummingbirds and the bees and butterflies, those are ones that you really want in your garden. Um, so first of all, having like a shallow source of water um, will help to encourage them to stay at your garden once they find your flowers and everything. Um, so making sure you have a really good environment for them to want to stay is important. But especially so for the hummingbirds, they really like those like trumpet, those, uh, so their beak can go right into it. So more of those like trumpet, um, trumpet flowers and vines. And then they also really like the bright red colors and just bright, bright flowers and um, things like bee balm and sage and, um, all of those are going to be really helpful for encouraging them to come in. And then also for bees, I mean, all of these are going to be very similar too. So bees love to anything that's bright and they like to have like large amounts of flowers instead of like just intermixed flowers. So if you have like a actual like flower garden, it'll help to attract bees more. So they really like things like sunflowers um, and native plants are really good to help encourage them as well. So any sort of native, native wildflowers and things like that. Um, bee balm again is a great name for it because it attracts bees. Uh, bee balm is gorgeous too. If you guys haven't seen bee balm, you definitely need to get that and grow that. Um, and then butterflies, again, very similar with any sort of like flowering herbs are really good too. So things like lavenders, rosemary, um, chives are really good too. Um, I have a picture right here of one of our butterflies that's on our pineapple sage. Uh, and that was always one of their very favorite plants and one of 
my favorite reasons for growing pineapple sage was to encourage all of the butterflies and the pollinators that it helps to bring in. Um, so pretty much anything that's bright colored and flowers, any flowering herbs, anything like that. Um, and then again, like native, native plants are always going to help to bring in those pollinators. Yeah. And definitely shout out to the herbs because I didn't realize before we started growing them, how much they would bring in pollinators and especially things like sage, like you mm -hmm. said, um, rosemary, when it all goes to flower in the summer, it'll be covered in bees more than anything else in our garden. Bee balm um, is a big Lavender. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like I could go on and on. So companion, like those, those are probably the superstars of the companion world are going to be your herbs because not only do they help with bringing in pollinators, they also repel pests. They have a ton of health benefits. There's just a lot of reasons to grow herbs. You're going to see a lot of companion guides that you see talk about things like basil and oregano and thyme and rosemary and all these things. And, you know, we have a great question here that I want to go ahead and pull up. Um, it was about whether or not this works in greenhouse planting. And some of these concepts definitely don't apply because you don't have to worry about um, flying pests and stuff as much. But you are going to be dealing with some of the, the other pests, like the root nematodes and things like that. Um, also, I think the big thing I want to mention on this is there's a lot of studies that have shown that basil improves the flavor of tomatoes that are grown near it, you know, those type of things. And also helps the tomatoes grow bigger and better as well. So those type of things are going to help you, whether it's in a greenhouse or outside, but definitely some of these concepts don't necessarily apply to the greenhouse complaint, uh, planting. All right. Next slide. Yeah. Next one. Okay, and then there's the plants that can help bring in your warriors of the garden. And these are things like the ladybugs, praying mantis, and the predatory wasps. These ones are are really important to have in your garden. I know it's terrifying. A lot of people do not want wasps, but they are so helpful in the garden. They fight so many of your other pests that you will have in your garden and they can help especially with like tomato hornworms they are just a huge huge beneficial um creature to have into your garden um so again very similar to the pollinators by attracting them in just make sure to to always have some some source of water so that way they can stay in um Oh, what about dragonflies? Yep. Dragonflies for sure definitely fall into this category too. I mean, they are really good and they are good predators too. They can help to fight a lot of um, your pests as well. I love dragonflies. I can't believe I didn't put a picture of a dragonfly up. <laughs> what was I thinking? <laughs> we forgive you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so dill is actually one of the biggest ways to help to bring in these wasps. Um, they absolutely love dill. Um, and fennel is another really good one to help to attract these as well. Um, although fennel isn't great to be planting right next to a lot of your plants because it is definitely not a great companion for vegetables, but if you have it like off to the side in your garden, it'll help to attract them and then they will go into your garden and they'll, they'll find other, other things to eat in there. Um, and then again, just having any source of, uh, flowers will help to attract them, especially the ladybugs. Um, they love marigolds and things like that couple questions that I think apply uh, to this. So the first one is from Michelle. How close do vegetables need to be to flowers to be planted? Um, so the way that we usually approach stuff like this is we try and put the perimeter of our beds, we try and have the perimeter outlined with some sort of really good companion, whether it's onions or herbs, uh, whatever it is. So like if I have a tomato plant, I'm going to have that tomato in the middle and I'm going to have basil kind of all around it. I'll probably have like four or five different types of basil planted all around the tomato kind of surrounding it. So that's generally how I plant all of my stuff like that. And we're going off the square foot gardening spaces. We're not necessarily like doing any closer than that. So we're just going off of that. So generally it's going to be depending on what it is, but like, you know, um, yeah, I mean, that's going to, how far away it just depends on, on the plant. And then kind of going along with what Dusty said here, that's a great idea. That's exactly the oh, kind of stuff sure, we yeah. do is we plant flowers and herbs and 
other great companions all around the edges of our bed. Mm -hmm. And the idea is that uh, it helps kind of create a barrier to where maybe the insects won't find what's in the middle of it. Yeah, so. we do this often where we just get our onion sets or our garlic and we just literally do a ring around <laughs> around it. So it really definitely helps. Yep. Okay, next slide. Yeah. Okay, and then plants that can help to improve the soil. So I know everybody's probably heard of the legumes and how great they are for your soil. So whenever I say legumes, I mean like peas, beans, southern peas. Um, clover is actually a legume in the legume family too. Um, they're all really, really good to help improve the soil quality because um, they can bring in nitrogen into the soil. And so that can really help make you not have to fertilize as much, right? Yeah, because there's nitrogen <laughs> in the air. And these plants are unique in that they can take it out of the air and put it in their soil. It's and, amazing. And, and the root, there's like a little root nodules. And they store it there. So the plant that you plant after that or the plant that you plant next to it can leach that nitrogen basically mm -hmm. and use it. So we pretty much always have either beans or peas growing in our garden, just depending on the time of year. We have peas in the cool season and we have beans in the warm season. And even in the very warm season, we have uh, black-eyed peas that can tolerate temperatures in 100 degrees like we get here in Oklahoma. Yeah, and they're great as a cover crop too. So if you aren't growing anything over winter, like just planting out a bunch of peas to try and improve your, your soil quality over the winter will really help too. And then the root crops help out a lot by mm -hmm. creating structure in the soil. So if we have an area that... Um, we're trying to create a garden that's in the ground and it's like really hard clay or something like that, or just it's, it needs some, some structure. It needs some aeration. We'll, we'll grow some like really big turnips or something like mm -hmm. that that grow down really deep and then also help pull up nutrients because their roots go down deep as well. So that's a lot and of that's, the, that's the same with the sunflowers because they're mm -hmm. so big and tall. They have a really good dense root structure so they can really help to break up any compacted soil or clay or anything like that and help to make that area easier to plant in and better to grow in next season. Yep. You know, there's actually a, um, a cool thing you can do with mustard that's kind of along this way too, where if you have an issue with a bed that got infected with uh, nematodes or like you know pest issues or whatever you can grow a okay. whole bunch of mustard in that bed and then cover it and it, as it like suffocates i guess the gases i'm not sure what it is but it yeah it kills the bugs yeah and yeah it's a i don't think we've actually actually, actually tried it but it, no but i've heard i've heard about that mm -hmm. yeah that's it's pretty cool i'd love to hear if anybody actually has tried that if you tried <laughs> that let us know yeah <laughs> So we were talking earlier about trap plants. So I listed just a few of the most common trap plants that you can use. Um, and we're covering up zinnias. That's fine. So we'll start with zinnias that we're covering <laughs> up. So I, I remember zinnias help deter, uh, well, attract uh, Japanese beetles. So if you are having any issues with those, plant some zinnias and they will go to the zinnias instead of where you are actually wanting, um, well, what you are wanting to harvest or eat or something like that, trying to protect your plants that the Japanese beetles are attacking. So I know roses are a big deal with Japanese yes. beetles. So plant your zinnias by your roses. That would help mm -hmm. out too. Zinnias also bring in praying mantises. They love to live like underneath the canopy of the zinnia mm -hmm. and they'll come in and ambush whatever comes on top. We got a really sad video of one getting a monarch once that we like we posted, but it was like uh, people weren't happy about it because like well it was it's very sad yeah it's showing a, a praying mantis it was cool <laughs> yeah that yeah. is the bad thing about praying mantis they can sometimes attack beneficials too they will attack everything pretty yep. much including you sometimes they do they're pretty cool though <laughs> they are really fun that day but that I was videoing the praying mantis I spent like an hour with it out there just like with my big camera zoomed in on it just watching it. Even
Hello. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> wow. I hope that we're we are back. Sorry. Thank you for everyone for sticking around. <laughs> I hope Appreciate that. Uh, yeah. I yeah. Hope, uh, Our internet just uh, just went down. Yeah. So, so we're we're tethered to my phone now. So I'm not going to be using my laptop. Uh, we'll try and keep up with chat. But we're going to have to use it on like the same one we're using up there. Um, <laughs> hey. <laughs> Hopefully the connection is good enough for us to uh, to do that. Hopefully we're not too blurry. All okay. right, we got to get the PowerPoint back. Yeah, sorry one guys. <laughs> The, th- the problems we have with uh, doing this live, right? And one time we were doing a live stream and a bird flew into our house. That's right. And flew into the office where we were doing the live stream. Like out of nowhere, literally, a bird flew into our house. So we have dealt with some things during these live streams before. <laughs> At least it wasn't anything that, that exciting, I guess. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. All right. Where were we? We were talking about, I think we were done with this slide, weren't we? And yes. Then oh, yes. Plants. We were talking trap plants. Okay. Um, Zenius. We were talking about uh, praying mantis. We yeah. had just wrapped up praying mantis discussion. Okay. <laughs> um, yes. So a common practice is by planting trap plants. So it pretty much protects the plant that you're wanting to harvest. Um, so if you are really wanting to grow broccoli or something and you're having issues with harlequin bugs or something if you plant the mustard next to it they'll be more likely to go and attack the mustard whereas you can have the broccoli that you can harvest so yeah yeah it it works really good so this is something we do a lot especially early in the season is we will plant trap crops in places where we had pest issues like the previous year um, we'll do this. Mm-hmm. There's a squash that is a blue Hubbard squash is one that will do this for squash bugs where we'll plant that squash real early in the season, wherever we had squash bug issues, all the squash bugs will kind of gravitate to that one. And then we do our best to, this says no sound. Uh Oh, <laughs> can y'all, can you all hear us? Sound is fine. Okay. 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 So then the squash bugs will gravitate to that blue Hubbard squash. You do your best to capture all of them in that one instance of you basically like chop the plant, throw it in a trash bag, throw that in the fire, like get get them out of here. Um, but that's a strategy that has worked for us in the past with squash bugs. They're still going to find you again. It just delays them a little bit and you can kind of keep doing that too. Um, but that's kind of what the trap method is all about. Okay, so now let's talk about a few specific pests that I called out, like probably the ones that are most commonly used with companion planting. So I called out a few of them here. Uh, But first of all, aphids. I mean, everybody I'm sure has had aphid issues um, in the past. And there, uh, there are several plants that can help you with aphids. So first of all, again, I know we were talking about fennel before. So if you just have it like off by itself, somewhere uh, not super close to that vegetable. Um, It can really help to help with the aphids because it can really bring in the ladybugs. Um, Same with the marigold. Marigold can help to encourage ladybugs and ladybugs will just devour your aphids. They love eating aphids. Um, And then nasturtiums works really well for a trap for the aphids too. And then these other ones here, so onions, mint, and also like catnip, things like that, Um, petunias, garlic, basil, all of these are really fragrant and they will actually repel aphids. So again, if you do like the planting of a perimeter, as we were talking about earlier, you can help to protect those plants by having these strong scents and strong odors around your area that you're having issues with. And then plants that can help with cucumber beetles are going to be, so there's a few different trap plants that you can do. There's the radish and nasturtium. Those will help to trap your cucumber beetles. And then again, having marigold and catnip, these are going to be amazing companions too that can help actually repel the cucumber beetles. They're actually known to help do that. So anytime that we have, um, any any sort of cucumber beetle issue, we always have marigolds. I mean, 
honestly, I feel like I, I plant marigolds everywhere just because marigolds is such an amazing companion plant for mm-hmm. like everything. And it helps to bring in so many good things. Like marigold is like amazing. I feel like. It's also a lot of different colors and varieties, and we like I to know. collect varieties, so it's a bit of a problem when we're dealing with marigolds because <laughs> we end up growing a lot of them. Well, I love marigold. There, there's actually a whopper marigold that's huge. Like they they grow these huge marigold flowers. They're so pretty. That's that's probably my favorite one to grow. We catch up on a couple questions that came up mm-hmm. while we were gone. Um, so from Brown Bear, are pill bugs bad or good? So pill bugs typically are a sign that there's some sort of dead or decaying material in that bed. Um, and they're usually not a problem. Now we have seen them go after like strawberries, I think mm-hmm. have been, but again, that's usually if there's some sort of like dead strawberry stuff up underneath the strawberries. Um, if they become too big of a problem, you just kind of relocate them, but we've never, we, we usually just like clean up the area if they're, if they're becoming too much and, so, and they go away. Yeah. If you're having an issue, like a really easy way to do it, like you can lay down a newspaper and get it moist and then come out in the morning and lift it up. And you'll see like, there's typically like a big cluster, like there's all your roly polies right there. Um, so that's a really easy way to kind of get them all together. And um, if you have a compost area, move them over in that area. Yeah. And then that's a good spot for them to hang yeah. out. And then um, what about attracting worms? So um, we don't necessarily use plants to attract worms. The way that we attract worms is by creating a really good mulch environment because worms don't like it when the soil is dried out and hot and they like like cool, moist temperatures. So if you mulch your soil, it'll bring extra worms up. Also, if you mulch with things like shredded leaves, they love to eat those shredded leaves. So they'll come up and, 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 uh, and eat the leaves and hang out around there. So they don't like wood chips as much. So shredded leaves are the best mulch for that. Shredded newspaper, um, you know, stuff like that is what we use for attracting worms. But really, you don't have to do much to attract them. They're going to find that if you have good, mm-hmm. good compost and you have all of that going on, the worms are going to find you. You don't have to worry about that. And then um, question, will there be a replay of this afterwards? So all of these workshops are posted to our YouTube. Um, they go there automatically when, when it's done. So you can find all the ones we've done in the past. And all of that right there on our YouTube. If you go to our YouTube channel, there's a section there for... For live workshops, yep. Yep. All right. Okay, next plant or next next pest. Japanese beetles. <laughs> Again, I know a lot of people talk about Japanese beetles and have issues with them, um, not only for edibles, but for roses, as we were talking about earlier. Um So these are really good ones to grow to help repel Japanese beetles. So again, it's going to be like your strong scents. So the garlic, lemon balm, catnip, mints, chives, marigold, those things are really going to help to repel Japanese beetles. And then I actually read this, which was really interesting, but the white geranium, this, so specifically it has to be white. I I don't know. They must be attracted Hmm. to the color white. Um, I read that a few different places. I was like, that's very interesting. Makes sense because they fly at night mostly. Yeah. Like they, so they come out at night. So yeah. like white flowers attract the night flying stuff. So that makes sense. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. So that if you are having an issue, you can grow a white geranium as a trap for them. They love them apparently. Nice. <laughs> oh, and then the dreaded squash bugs. These are my nemesis every single year. Um, and I, we did actually grow dill right next to our squash. I know last year we tried this too. And I, I do feel like the dill really helped. Um, but the dill brings in wasps in particular. It really attracts those predatory wasps. So it should r- really help to get rid of your squash bug issues. Um, and then radish again. I know we've talked a little bit about this before too, like the daikon radish. Um, that can help to uh, work as a trap plant as well. Um, and then there's also like nasturtiums and marigolds, oregano. Those things are known to help to repel squash bugs as well from, from your plants. And then the dreaded tomato hornworms. Those are very, very <laughs> annoying as well. And with how large they are, it's amazing how much they blend in. Like they are huge and um, terrifying menacing looking but uh they're the rel- horn won't hurt you, you yes can, it's very menacing looking it, it looks, is menacing looking but it's not gonna hurt you i still won't touch it. i still i know this in my head i still won't like <laughs> i know i know i feel the same way 
Um, so a really great way to help to deter these tomato hornworms are by attracting in those predatory wasps because those predatory wasps will actually like lay their eggs in or on your tomato hornworm. And I, I should have popped a picture up of it. <clears throat> it's really disturbing looking like you'll see like the white eggs on it and you'll be like, what in the world is this? Like the first time you see it, it'll, it'll freak you out probably. But um, it's a good thing because it means that the wasp has won. Um, <clears throat> so ways to attract those wasps again, parsley is really good at doing that. And then I made a note here to make sure I mentioned mature dill plants are really good at bringing in wasps. Um, and because I, I did see that the younger dill plants can all actually attract tomato hornworms. Oh, really? Yeah. So transplant them out when they're bigger. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. So I wanted to make sure I wrote, write, wrote down mature dill. And then basil, of course, and marigold. Those are my, those are my two go-to um, companion plants, too, for tomatoes every single time. So those ones will really help as well. And it's because of this tomato hornworm. All right. So I know we've got some questions we need to go to. And one of them, I don't know off the top of my head. So let's go to Cheryl's question here, which is, what can I plant with my strawberries that will have their own smart pot? Um, actually, I'm Ooh, sorry. She that's, has a pretty purple I knew that one. There was a different I one it. I didn't know the answer to. This one will go ahead and answer. Um, so we typically plant strawberries all by themselves and let them take over an entire smart pot. We don't typically companion plant. If we do, it's spinach because we can get sneak some spinach in before the strawberries start to like get really big. That's the only thing we'll try and sneak in generally is just some like greens in between. But once it takes off, we want them to completely kind of take over. Yeah, but you make sure you check out the app too because we have that section. So if you pull up strawberries and go to companions on there, it'll say exactly like which plants you can plant with it and which ones you should avoid too. Okay, here's the one I wasn't sure on. So the question is about why strawberries are making runners and not fruit. Okay, so I've got the app Growbot here. Hopefully this you can see. <laughs> ah, that worked okay. Over on the right, you can see a screenshot <laughs> of it. So Growbot is available in the App Store, and it's an AI chatbot that we build that we trained on our data. So I'm going to ask it. Um, I'm gonna... My strawberries are making a bunch of runners, but no fruit. What could be the problem? Okay. So says we need to do some pruning. Too many runners can divert. Well, yeah. Enough sunlight, water, nutrient deficiencies. So it's going to get you on the right track with that. It misunderstood me on the want to be the problem instead of what is the problem. So <laughs> let me ask it again. And I'm going to type because I'm not the best talker. <laughs> what nutrient... Can I add for strawberries to produce more fruit is what I'm typing. And it's telling us that we can add a balanced fertilizer with equal amounts. So basically just use a balanced fertilizer. That's what I'd recommend is it's probably low on some sort of nutrient that it needs to produce fruit. So, um, but the, the one thing I want to show there too is the Growbot app is available. You can ask it gardening questions, um, things that are specific to your area too. It's really good for because um, the advice in the app we try to make it as generic as possible for across the country. But if you're asking what type of apple grows best in Washington, that might be something that is better suited for something like Growbot. Um, okay, we've got a few other questions we'll go through, and then we will announce our winner. Um, Amy has a really good suggestion here. Daikon radish is a great cover crop. We use that all the time as squash. Um, one of the best ones for repelling squash bugs. And it, they get really big too. So it's really good with helping with the soil. So shout out for that. that. Definitely agree. Um, okay. So question here about ants work with aphids. So ants actually basically farm aphids. So Ants like to eat the nectar that aphids produce, basically. Like, it's the sweet stuff they... It's gross. That's what they do. Okay. Um, 
that's what the ants like, and they will farm the aphids in order to get that. So that's that's the relationship between ants and aphids. If you see a lot of ants, sometimes they can be an indicator that you have aphids. So sometimes if I have a garden bed and I see just a whole bunch of ants around, I'll start checking for aphids because usually it's a sign that that's a bed that there's going to be some sort of an aphid problem with. Okay, we'll do one more question, and then um, we'll announce the winner, and then we can stick around for a little bit more questions. So question, is there a, a bug that helps with powdery mildew? So powdery mildew is generally something that's caused by too much water. It's not really something you can help with that aside from just not overwatering. Or if you get a bunch of rain, there's a solution you can make that is equal parts milk and water. And you spray that on your leaves of your plants and that helps as well. Also just watering in the morning as opposed to at night can really help too with this. Okay, we've got a winner, and this is normally where I enter it in on my other computer. So one second, <laughs> since we're down to one computer. And congratulations to Cassandra Blackman. Cassandra Blackman. Yay! So email us at info at cdespoon.net, and we will get you set up with a year access to Cdespoon Premium. Uh, with that, you'll get uh, free shipping. Yeah, is now I was part just about of that. to say, free shipping. We just That's added free shipping. Thing. We're really excited about that. But in the app, you also get uh, unlimited plants you can add into your database. You get access to the calendar feature. The task view has a bunch of enhanced features in there if you're a premium, feature, uh, premium member. We have the new garden themes feature that's rolling out this week. Um, you get access to Growbot in the app with unlimited questions right there in the app. Um, I think that and so many things. There's it's a lot going on. It's hard yeah. to remember. <laughs> so congratulations. Uh, reach out to us at info at cdspoon.net and we will get you set up. All right. Let me look and see what other questions we got here. If you have other questions that you've asked that I haven't answered, throw them back in the chat. I'm trying, like, we're down to one computer here. <laughs> I'm trying to do my best to catch up here, but I've got a few I can go ahead and answer here. And then, like I said, if, if I haven't answered it, uh, throw it in the chat again, please. So a question from Dusty about how to know what zone you're in. So if you use our app, you don't necessarily need to know what zone you're in because we calculate planting dates and all of that for you based on your nearest weather station. Um, but obviously you're probably gonna wanna know what your zone is for other purposes. Like if you're buying a perennial tree, it, they'll say like what zone they're cold hardy down to. So with that, you can go like to search what is my zone in Google and Whatever comes up first will be a great resource for telling you exactly what zone you're in. But you're, you don't necessarily need to know that if, um, if you're just looking at it. Yeah. 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 We'll, we'll give you we'll all of it for you. Um, question here about natural pesticides. So we've tried the natural pesticides. We've made it with cayenne pepper and garlic and onion all mixed together. Um, um I don't know, like we, we tried it once. We, we usually go with the Espoma insect sprays though. That's what we end up using. It's all organic. It's a lot easier. It's a lot easier. Yeah. We're not like boiling peppers in the kitchen with a bunch of toddlers around yeah. and everyone's eyes are watering. There's just a lot going <laughs> on <laughs> when you're making your own pepper spray. We've, um, done, we've done sprays with garlic too before. Um, and that that's worked well, I feel like too. Yeah. Okay, question here. So if a plant is not a good companion, but it's planted in a pot next to it, is it okay? Um, it's gonna depend. So some things are not good companions because they attract the exact same pests. So if you have those planted next to each other in pots, they're still gonna attract those pests and you're still gonna have a problem. So, um, but if it's a companion where it's like marigolds helping with the, the, the root nematodes, that's not going to help unless it's in the same pot. So it just depends on each one, I guess, is the, is the easiest way to, to answer that. Um, question here from Jordan. Do we make our own compost? We do make our own compost, but with the scale of what we're building right now, like we, we're completely redoing our garden and building a whole lot of, of new raised beds. I'm, right now, I'm having to buy compost in bulk um, just because of how many raised beds we're building. But when we lived in the city, 
most of our compost we made ourselves, um, especially once we got our beds established. At that point, everything we made was our own stuff. We had worm bins, a lot, a lot of that kind of stuff. Um, now that we live on a farm and we have goats and stuff like that, it's a lot easier and I can cheat and just go scoop up where they, where the goats have been and then take all that and make compost from it and stuff. And I have a tractor and stuff. It's a lot easier. It's cheating now <laughs> compared to when I was in the city and I was literally unloading barrels of wood chips every single day from the back of my truck and hauling them around through a fence. And well, and in the city we had rabbits also too. Yeah. So I was in a lot better shape. That's I lived a really in the city good though, option. That, Cause I was doing all that hauling <laughs> wood chips every single day. Um, good companions around yellow summer squash from Catherine. So it's going to be the same things we talked about earlier. Uh, daikon radish is a big one. I'll give you a, a shout out for yarrow is another good companion for yellow squash. But again, if you go in the app and you go to, um, to summer squash in the app, there's a section right there that shows you all of the best companion plants for squash and also which one to, which ones to avoid and all that kind of stuff. A um, couple of really nice comments in here about the premium version. Thank you, guys. Todd is enjoying awesome. using it. Great. Cheryl's been using it. So that's yeah, awesome to I've see. Been, I've been using it a lot myself, too. We've we are been... chronicling our entire garden yeah. in the app. Been so busy. <laughs> how many? We had like, we found, if you have like more than 20 peppers, there's a UI issue. We found that. So we're <laughs> fixing that. We are pushing the limits of the app and, yeah. and everything. So it's been, it's been nice, though. It's been fun to go through and track everything we're doing in it and a lot of new features are coming out of that too, just geared towards people that have large gardens. But, you know, if you're using the app out there and you have ideas or feedback, please let us know. Let us know in the chat during one of these. Um, a lot of the ideas that we get kind of come from from your suggestions and yeah. stuff. So, oh, thanks, Ellen. Check us out. Oh, that's great. Awesome. I'm so glad you have a have a green thumb now. <laughs> yeah, Dusty's making compost water. I used to do that too. Oh, I've been there. Nice. Yeah, when I first started, I was all into the compost water and worm tea and all of that. Um, um, here's kind of my opinion on the whole topic of compost water and worm tea and all that. Is it definitely works, but I think it doesn't work that much more than just putting all that stuff on the soil and letting it rain. Like that, that's kind of in uh, my one of my favorite YouTube channels. I don't think he makes YouTube videos anymore. But One Yard Revolution, all his old stuff is still up. He did a lot of really cool experiments with this. And I learned a lot from his channel. I love his channel. Shout out to that channel. Um, but that's definitely definitely something I would get. Um, sorry, we said the info too fast. Uh, email us at info at seedtospoon.net. Um, and then here, uh, Andrew, can you reply to her and put it in there in chat so she has it right there, please? A uh, question about worm bins. So um, we have a couple worm bins that we've made that were made out of like a, a tote. I think we have an old video on that. Maybe not. We I need to make another one. My There's also colleagues. some really like a worm factory as a product that we have uh, that we've bought before. That's pretty cool. Um, yeah. We'll have to make an entire workshop dedicated to worm bins, I feel like. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot. It's fun. I love it. The kids love it, too. Okay. Well, I think we've got the questions. Um, and I hear a baby starting to wake up. So <laughs> um, that means it is time for us to go. But thank you, everyone, for joining. Thank you for sticking around through our technical issues. <laughs> Appreciate it. It's always an adventure. What are we talking about next week? I don't know, actually. Ooh, surprise Ooh, for next week. It is a surprise. I can look it up real quick. I don't remember what I planned. You do have one Thursday as well. Oh, I do actually. Thursday, yeah. we're talking all about the new varieties that we have in the app and, the, and through Park Seed. So check out that one. There's a lot of really cool new varieties. They're new edibles we're going to be talking yeah. about on Thursday. A lot of them are purple. <laughs> 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 Lots of really good ones. Okay, yeah. let's see. There, I'm looking down. I don't even see where I put her on the spot. Oh, right there. Okay. Hardening off and transplanting cool season crops. Oh, so next nope. week we're going to talk. It was indoor seed starting for warm season crops. <laughs> that's lied. that's okay. two weeks from now. Peppers. So it's all about peppers, tomatoes, tomatillos, eggplant. Yeah. Cucumber. Tips for getting them watermelon. started in, indoors. Yep. Yeah. All right. Well, that'll be fun. Thanks everyone for joining <laughs> us. And if you have any questions when you're watching this later, 
uh, leave them in chat. We'll, uh, we'll check back in. Thank you all for joining us today. It was fun.